Okay, in this lecture, we just want to uh, talk about a brief overview of linear elastic finite element analysis. So this is assuming that you've had some introductory course where you've covered a lot of these concepts. So this really is a, is a, a rapid overview um, leading into a, a development of the, the governing equations that we want to solve uh, for a, a generalized 3D solid. Uh, with linear elastic uh, finite elements, so this is sort of a, an intro into developing those uh, those equations that will that we will uh, work through in the upcoming lectures. Okay, so let's just begin, and I'll just remind you of the governing equation that we ended up with for uh, for uh, approximating the equations of motion for a three D solid. So let's just say we can recall uh, that the approximation of the equations of motion uh, take the following form. So, and, I, and, and if you don't remember the equations of motion, don't worry, when we actually develop what I'm about to write down, we'll, we'll go through that more carefully. But we ended up with a mass matrix M times an acceleration U double dot, which was a function of T, right, plus stiffness matrix K times the displacement vector u, u as a function of t, uh, is going to be equal to the uh, nodal reaction force vector that we'll just call f, which is also can be a function of time. Okay, Let's call that equation 1. So let me go ahead and, and go back through and define these, uh, these um, variables. So this m is the mass matrix. And again, we'll go back through all this again and develop this um, so, but hopefully it's not unfamiliar to you. Uh, this vector here is our nodal acceleration vector. Okay, K is of course a stiffness matrix. U is our nodal displacements. And then of course F is our nodal reaction forces. So hopefully that's an equation that uh, looks familiar to you. Um, uh, in the special case of static loading, uh, then we approximate the equilibrium equations, right? So I'll write that down. So in the special case of static loading, we're going to approximate the, equal, the equilibrium equations. And if we did that, we end up with maybe our more familiar term, which is k times u, and I'm not putting it as a function of t anymore because this is a static case, uh, is going to be equal to uh, some reaction force vector F. We'll call that equation two. Okay, so where did the the these acceleration and displacement vectors come from? How how did they how did we arrive at them? So I just want to again remind you of, of where those came from. So let's say recall. Uh, we introduced a, a polynomial approximation, and that approximation was often linear. We introduced a polynomial approximation uh, of the displacement field, okay, which we just will label u as a vector. So the underbar in this signifies a, a vector as a function of uh, c and t. You could have x, but it's either c or x being the spatial coordinates. Okay. So. So that doesn't really yet tell me what, what this vector of nodal displacements uh, is. So, so how did it come about? Well, what we did was we used, um, uh, we used the values of the nodal displacements, which we didn't know, as our unknown coefficients in our polynomial approximation. Okay, So we used the values uh, of uh, the nodal displacements uh, as the unknown coefficients right, uh, in the polynomial approximation. Okay, so I'll underline unknown coefficients so that that's clear. Okay, when we did this, this, this let us write a displacement approximation. Okay, so this led to the following displacement approximation. And we'll go ahead and write that displacement approximation. We'll say u sub i, and I'm going to put a star to indicate that it's an approximation. And remember, it's a spatial quantity, so it's a function of c. Right, some spatial quantity, and in this case, 
uh, C, as I'm using it here, is a, is a natural coordinate, so it's, it's, it's relative to the element. It's not a global coordinate uh, for which I would use X. Okay? But we said that that approximation was equal to the following. N, which is a function of C as well, transpose times ui sub e. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and define this. I'll, I'll label this as equation three. And and so let me just give you the the terms here. Uh, this is the displacement approximation, um, and the i signifies the direction of that. Uh, Approximation, so it would be typically be one, two, or three, or x, y, or z. So it's the displacement approximation in the x direction or the y direction, the z direction. Okay, so I'll just say in the ith direction. Okay, how about n? Hopefully you remember that n is our our interpolation functions. Okay, and, and again, don't panic if you don't remember all the, the forms of those equations. We're going to go back and revisit those. This is just a high-level overview of, of where we're headed. And then this u sub i with a, with a subscript in the front e, that's the nodal displacements of the element in the ith direction. Okay, so the nodal displacements of the element uh, in the ith direction. Okay? So hopefully, that, that again, this is not unfamiliar to you. So again, th this, this, uh, this lecture assumes that you have had uh, some sort of an intro to FEA course. And typically in your intro course, you're going to have focused on a very specific case of these problems. So uh, in your intro course, uh, you probably focused on linear elastic materials, uh, subject to small strain and small displacement, okay? Uh, and what that did, if, if you made those assumptions, was that it allowed the quantities K, your stiffness matrix, and M to be constant um, for the entire loading, okay? In, in uh, the general case, that's not always true. So uh, K and M may be variable. They may be dependent on U. Uh, they may have a variety of nonlinear components. Um, they may be time dependent, those kinds of things. So uh, in this class, we're going to begin. We're not going to exhaustively cover it, but we're going to start to cover um, some of these more complex cases. So uh, I'll just tell you quickly what we're going to explore. So in this class, uh, we're going to explore the following. Uh, number one, we're going to uh, explore nonlinearity that arises from the following way, uh, in the following ways. So nonlinearity arising from, so I'll say the first place it could arise from would be the boundary conditions. Uh, and just to give you an easy example of that, uh, what about contact, right? Contact is a boundary condition that may be engaged or may not be engaged. And, and before it's engaged, even if you have a linear elastic material, uh, it behaves linearly right up until you have a new boundary condition. So it actually um, uh, it breaks that linearity. That, that is a form of nonlinearity that has to be handled in a you know, way that's a little different than what you've handled, uh, sort of your traditional linear approach. The second uh, way that nonlinear nonlinear uh, behavior can arise is from uh, just nonlinear materials. So nonlinear material behavior. And that could be both constitutive, uh, and by that I mean that just the intrinsic uh, stress strain response is, is nonlinear. So a rubber band, for example, might be a nonlinear elastic material. So that's one way. Uh, and or uh, some, some form of damage, right? or plasticity. Any of those things could cause nonlinear behavior. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third form of nonlinear behavior that's important is geometric nonlinearity. Uh, uh, so let's we'll say geometric nonlinearity. And what's geometric nonlinearity? Well, 
that means that that the geometry of the problem changes throughout the loading, so it, uh, at least to a degree that's significant enough that we need to reformulate the stiffness matrix to, to solve for that. So the easiest way that I would think of geometric nonlinearity is a, a fishing rod. Right? If, you, if, you're, if the fishing rod is originally straight, uh, you, you catch a fish, it bites, and it's now going to flex the rod. When it flexes the rod, uh, it, it's going to align the load in a different way. And if you don't account for the, the changing geometry of the rod, if you just solve the problem on the original configuration of a straight rod, uh, you're not going to get even close to the correct solution. So that's sort of a uh, maybe a gross example of uh, geometric nonlinearity. A second uh, a feature that we're going to explore in this class uh, is, is we're going to explore the solution to dynamic problems. Okay. And maybe you covered a little bit of that in the intro class. We're going to dig a little deeper maybe than you covered before. We'll talk about natural frequencies. We'll talk about different solution techniques. Um, uh, so I'll just say uh, solution techniques and formulations uh, for dynamic problems. Okay? And then finally, towards the end of the class, uh, I'm actually going to... Uh, introduce uh, a topic called variational calculus and the reason is that I want you at least to be aware of how we develop the governing equations um, for our approximation for our, our differential equation approximation using what's called variational principles and, and it turns out we're going to use uh, the principle of uh, uh, minimum potential energy to to develop the the exact same governing equations that we will use uh, that, that will that we derived rather um, when we use the Galerkin weak form method that we're going to talk about uh, earlier. So I want to, I want to cover that, uh, and that'll be towards the end of class after we've kind of com covered the, um, the nonlinearity and the dynamic uh, component of the modeling. Okay, so let me write that down. So we're going to explore um, uh, how uh, to develop the approximations, so finite element approximations. Uh, using variational methods. All right, so all that, all that's sort of a, a roadmap for where we're going. Uh, but before we delve into these new areas, I want to go ahead and present a complete development uh, of a linear elastic finite element model for a generalized 3D solid using fully integrated brick elements. Okay, so that's what we're going to focus on in the upcoming weeks. And then uh, I will also have you uh, write your own uh, 3D FEA code uh, in MATLAB. So, so kind of pay attention, make sure that you're uh, comfortable with all the material that we're, I'll be presenting going forward. Uh, but, but let me write down sort of the general steps that we're going to be do, uh, working on. So I'll just say before this, though, okay, uh, we're going to present a complete development for a linear elastic finite element model uh, for a generalized 3D solid. Uh, using fully integrated brick elements. Okay, uh, this is going to involve the following. Uh, number one, we're going to go back and develop the weak form of the governing differential equation. Uh, number two is we're going to select our interpolation functions. In this case, they'll be linear. Okay, and when we're selecting interpolation functions, at least a, a component of that is uh, is choosing the element type, or rather choosing the element type partially uh, is defined by the interpolation function. So I'll, I'll just write in the parentheses, these are elements. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how to evaluate stiffness, uh, how to evaluate integrals to get the stiffness matrix. Okay. Okay. And, and if you recall back to your previous class, that's going to involve two important features. One will be element mapping. So remember we we map an element back to its reference coordinate, uh, or its natural coordinates, rather, so that we can apply uh, typically Gauss quadrature, right? So it's going to involve uh, element mapping and some form of numerical quadrature, which will, in our case, be Gauss quadrature. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about assembling the stiffness matrices of all the elements, something that hopefully you've already uh, done in the past. So we'll just say uh, global matrix assembly. Uh, the application of boundary conditions to this model. Uh, and then finally, uh, once we have solved uh, uh, the, the equations, we end up with obviously a 
displacement vector and a, and a force vector. So now that we have those, how do we go about getting stress and strain? So we'll talk about computing stress and strain. Okay, you'll notice uh, maybe a step in between five and six that I left out, and I deliberately left it out, and that's the actual solution of the of the um, matrix equation. So uh, we're just going to use uh, various built-in functions. Um, I'm not going to cover in depth um, some of the the sparse solvers and things like that that folks might be using to to speed up their their FEA codes. I really want to focus on sort of the fundamentals in this class. So we won't be talking about um, uh, more linear algebra specific techniques for for improving the solution process. We'll just go ahead and use the built-in functions uh, either in MATLAB or or something uh, you know some basic sort of LUD composition to solve these uh, these matrix equations. So with that, that's sort of the the roadmap of where we're going. But also, I just want to give you a heads up that we're going to spend a significant amount of time reviewing what I hope hope that you have seen before uh, in your previous class and. Uh, if you're anything like me, uh, I remember I took um, uh, an undergraduate finite element uh, analysis class, and when I got to the graduate uh, version, all I remembered was that there was uh, there was a lot of matrices that I really couldn't explain how they came about. So uh, if that's you, don't panic. We're going to work through it, uh, hopefully at a pace that you can follow easily. Um, but uh, but I, but I do want to go through that so that uh, you feel really comfortable with the with the quote unquote easy stuff, the linear, the linear stuff before we move on to this more, um, the more complex uh, topics. So uh, with that, uh, that will be the topic of our, uh, our next lectures going forward is developing these, uh, this linear elastic model uh, just for the purpose of review and uh, reinforcement.